Hey everyone, so here's a fun interview I did with John Lee Brody, filmmaker, Corgi Dad. I think you're gonna enjoy the uh, interview as much as I enjoyed having it. I actually met John uh, via Twitter, via Freddie Prince Jr. So uh, John and Freddie had started a YouTube channel, Gaghead, for uh, gamers, video games, tabletop games, MMA, all sorts of fun stuff. And I was sort of telling them about, you know, how to run a YouTube channel. And John and I sort of connected through that. And we kind of sat down and had this really fun interview. We talked about everything you could possibly imagine. It's a really, really fun interview. I think you're gonna like it, but I have two things I wanna to get to first. First off, just based on our, based on the interview you're gonna see, first, stop Asian hate. Like, just seriously, f that bigotry dead. Like, it needs to stop, 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 stop. Secondly, John, I'm gonna hold you to it. I'm vaccinated now. We need to play Balderdash, so we need to make that happen. So anyway, those are the two things. I hope you like this interview. Let's get to it. Hey John, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited about this. So one of the things I like to do on my YouTube channel is just showcase people in general because I think food is community. And I connected to you, I think, through... Twitter through Freddie Prince Jr., right? Like you mm -hmm. guys were, uh, you had launched a YouTube channel. And if you want to talk YouTube, by the way, we can talk YouTube. I don't know. How's that going for you? Uh, pretty good. You know, I'm mean, obviously we're still in a pandemic. So, uh, you know, certain things are kind of limited because a lot of our content is tabletop board games, tabletop RPG, which a lot of them require for everybody to be in the same room. So we did have to do a pivot, obviously, when we went into lockdowns because we had to find kind of a remote, remote way to do it, which has become kind of the norm. And, uh, but also it gives us a chance, uh, it made me kind of think of, oh, well, maybe this can be a hybrid model because I think work-wise, remote meetings aren't going to go away. It's always better to be in person when it's safe, obviously. Uh, right. I mean, that goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, just so nobody <laughs> tries to say I'm not trying to be safe. And um, <laughs> yeah, and it's called uh, Gaghead, which is the word egghead, but with a G in front of it. That's how Freddie yeah. explains it. And for whatever reason, that is the easiest way to explain to people how to spell it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and then that's kind of it in a nutshell. And then, yeah, you and I met. It was a really, this is what Freddie likes to do to me on on Twitter is he'll link up with cool people like yourself. And then all of a sudden I'm tagged in a random tweet. Hey, just DM John Lee Brody and uh, he'll talk to you about it. And I have no idea what he's tagging me for. But all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, like Freddie wouldn't do me wrong. So I'm, it's not like right. I'm going to question it, but it's always... My notif I'll go into my notifications I'm like, oh, I need to talk to this person, I guess. And then we linked up and now we're here. Yeah, he was a really fun interview. And it, um, when he launched his cookbook out, like that's when I kind of spoke with him. And, um, you know, he's been fun to talk to on Twitter. And I think I saw, yeah, I think I saw like he, he was announcing your YouTube channel or whatever. And I was like, I've been doing it for nine years. So if you, and I've like, I mean, I work with YouTube, like I know like the back end stuff too. So I'm like, we need help. <laughs> happy to yeah, help out yeah. you know um maybe and you were very helpful to your you were very awesome. generous with your knowledge and um and you know, i w we weren't in a place at that time to really um implement what you had told me but you gave you were very a lot of people they like to hold on to stuff and i'm i'm a believer in if you can pass on the knowledge you to pass on the knowledge i, I, I don't understand how people are like no i'm gonna keep it for myself because i don't want anyone else to succeed and i think that's well i think that's unfortunate uh, there's another word for it, but I'll be a little more uh, nice about it. <laughs> but I appreciate you being very generous about it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I had people early on who helped me out and explain things to me. And I think that, you know, I mean, I, you know, my YouTube following is pretty decent and it's grown a lot from people being, you know, helpful and generous with me. I, I'm a I'm a rising ties, lift all boats kind of guy, um, you know, and and YouTube is, you know, I mean, there's space for everyone to be a creator and to do something fun there. You know, if anything, especially right now, uh, you know, we need more content. <laughs> mm -hmm. not, yeah. And uh, that's, that's everybody, not just consumers, but uh, these networks and these studios, they don't want to show it, but they need yeah. content too. So yeah. and, that, and that's a good message for any creator out there because there really is no excuse anywhere to not create. I mean, obviously you can't create it to the, um, to the level you maybe were before the pandemic because you can't get yeah. together with people but there's a lot of innovative ways to do it you know when 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 you think about our you know for me like the filmmaking predecessors the robert Townsends, the robert rodriguez's who funded stuff on credit cards or whatever they had no choice but to shoot either on 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter film there were yeah. no red cameras we didn't have camera phones you know so i think 
it, the, there's a great advantage for creators coming up and coming of age during this time. Yeah, definitely. And I think like, I mean, I agree with you. It, it is so easy these days. I mean, everyone with their phone can do something if they want to, you know, and I will say this too, like, and this is why I was happy to help you guys, because I have people who reach out to me all the time on YouTube, They're like, oh, I want to start a YouTube channel. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking to do this thing. Can I, you know, ask you some questions? I probably have gotten thousands of those over the nine years that I've been doing my YouTube channel. Maybe one person has actually started it. So I, you know, I think like the hardest thing really is just doing it. That, that's the mm -hmm. biggest challenge I think for most people, you know, uh, the tools are there. Yeah, absolutely. The, the hardest, the, what's the old uh, cliche saying, like the hardest part of getting started or whatever, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, kind of just paraphrasing or whatever kind of put in my own words but it is and the and the hardest part's getting started but it's also it's equally if not harder to keep it going because in order to build that following you obviously need consistency you know and you need frequency and consistency and if uh it's you know when you drop off for too long you're kind of risking losing your audience so there's there's a balancing act you got to play and it's a lot of trial and error which um that's the the other advantage of it because it's not like we have a network putting pressure on us saying we have to deliver on these days it's like okay let's try this out let's release at this time and and yeah. you know with this content so it's been it's been a learning experience and i've learned a lot I've, I've learned a lot i've met a lot of cool people present company included and uh hopefully i can keep learning more yeah well i mean like i've been doing it for nine years and i literally just changed up my video format like a month ago and it's already getting like 25 percent more views as a result like, you know, and it, I mean, I've been doing it for this long and I'm still learning things. I mean, there's, you know, there's always ways to optimize and, you know, it helps if you have other people out there. So you can always hit me up for YouTube questions. Feel free. I appreciate it. <laughs> Happy to help. And then, you know, when things go back to normal, I'm not, I haven't played a lot of RPG stuff. Um, I'm a tabletop old school kind of board game person, but maybe I can come down and you, me and Freddie can play a board game at some point. That sounds awesome. <laughs> what, what are some of your favorites? Well, lately I've been playing uh, a lot of Ticket to Ride. I've heard about that. I, I haven't played it yet, though. I've been playing it digitally. So there's a digital version and um, it's just a fun game. It's one of those games where I, so I like games that have strategy, but I like a little bit of a social component to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like where you can kind of be, you can still talk to people. You're not so immersed that you can't like really converse or whatever. And that one's a good one. It's like a little bit of strategy. So you kind of have to think about it, but not so much where you can't be social. Um, my favorite game of all time is probably Boulder Dash. It's like from way back in the day. Oh, good. I play ball. I still play Boulder Dash. I love Boulder Dash. Okay, oh, yeah. that's, we should play that thing. I love Boulder Dash. <laughs> we were supposed to do that on our channel. Uh, one of our regulars, Amy Louise Pemberton, She's this just beautiful voice actress and British and, you know, Legends of Tomorrow. She's the voice of Gideon. She's the voice of Penny on Fortnite. And um, yeah, she playing Balderdash with British people is the best thing ever. So I highly recommend that. If, if you have access to someone who's British, play okay. some Balderdash. <laughs> I'll put that tweet out. I'll ask for someone. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag you and, and Freddie in a tweet. So say Balderdash is on the table because I love that game. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> I do too. And I love that more than, you know, people talk about cards against humanity and I'm like, no, you guys got to play Balderdash. I mean, cards against humanity, you get that because of the predecessors like Balderdash, in my opinion, you know, I, yeah. I really do think so. Totally. And well, that's the thing too. And I think like, I mean, I love cards against humanity, but like after like a handful of rounds, like I'm kind of spent on it. It's just sort of, it's so extreme that it kind of gets a little tiring, but um, for the first time in the ever, I played Cards Against Humanity with my mom and some of my older family members. And I will admit having my mom blur blurt out like big black was like one of the funniest things I've ever had a, the experience of doing. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, Card Cards Against Humanity, they're known for those that we played the Star Wars Cards Against Humanity. And it was probably the worst one. Like, it was like, they we're like, there's no way this is licensed by Lucasfilm. It was like vulgar, vulgar stuff about stuff I don't even want to repeat, honestly, about like the actors. And, uh, you know, there was Yoda's big green, which that was actually pretty funny. But then it got progressively like worse. And we're just like, yeah, we can't play this again because yeah. Freddy, of course, is part of the Star Wars franchise. Right. So it's like, I don't think this is, uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's stick a pin in this one now and not circle back to it like ever again but yeah, uh, yeah i love balder dash man I, I i'd be down for that whenever sweet. we can do this it's funny because like you know I, I feel like it's one of those games a lot of people don't know about so i'm, I'm actually surprised that you know about it but maybe it's just maybe more of it because you're in the creative writer space or whatever so you kind of understand those those well yeah i think so yeah i mean that that is part of kind of my dna i love to i'm such a student of of everything so i want to always know like what came before this and what's 
what's the what was the motivation of making the you know i'm very i i go deep into stuff if someone's saying like hey try this game out i'm not only trying the game out i'm i'm looking up who is the publisher who is the manufacturer who is this person like who designed it and uh but i also grew up in the 90s which would that was like the heyday of like you know 90s sitcoms 90s rom-coms with which starred freddie <laughs> prince jr many times right. and uh board <laughs> games you know because this was before the big digital boom like before Video game consoles got really advanced. You know, I think the most advanced at that point was maybe Nintendo 64, but I still love board games. And I still have a, I have a bunch of board games and I'm at my mom's house now in Chicago. I've been here since Thanksgiving, just kind of hiding out until COVID calms out in LA. And um, I have the full house board game, which believe it or not. And like, I, I have a copy of Baldur Dash here somewhere. Someone gave it to me. I think it was my classmate. Don't ask how I remember this stuff. I remember everything. It's kind of a blessing and a curse. I think fourth grade birthday party, Tommy Fox gave me a copy of Baldur Dash. So, and I still have it. <laughs> nice. It's a fun game. I just, I love it. It's um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I definitely look forward to that. So, you know, since you're not do it, you're kind of hanging out with your mom. You said you're in Chicago. I am. Yeah. How's your pandemic going outside of that? Like, you know, how's it been for you? Like I mentioned earlier about balancing acts. Uh, it's a balancing act for me too, because I'm naturally more of an introvert. Like I, I don't mind kind of hiding out and being a hermit or to use a Superman term because I'm a nerd, the fortress of solitude. You know, I, I was like, I can get up with that going to the North pole and being this, this ice castle. I'm cool with that. But you know, there's that risk of getting Stockholm syndrome, liking it a little too much, because at some point the world's going to open back up. We don't know when, hopefully it's soon, but it's going to open back up and I'm going to have to talk to people again in person. So, uh, but overall it's been good. You know, honestly, man, I'm not to get too like Zen Buddhism on you or anything like that. But during the pandemic, when we got locked down, I was like, well, this is an opportunity. What can I work on? Like, what can I, like, I'm such, like I said, I'm a student of everything. I was studying TV shows and films and kind of I, I take meticulous notes when I watch movies. I'm like, they're using this camera angle here. But this TV show is like always doing a cold open. That's six minutes. You know, I'm kind of reverse engineering how they put shows together. Nice. And also just catching up on sleep. You know, like there was, you know, something very liberating or calming that the whole world was shut down. So there was no pressure to like take a meeting or anything. I was like, I can just chill. I was yeah. very content doing that. Now I understand someone who's more extroverted that could be difficult because they enjoy being out. They enjoy being around people. Not that I don't, yeah. but that's just right. at a different level. But totally. overall, man, look, it's like anything. There's going to be peaks and valleys. There's There are a couple of times where anxiety was at an all-time high. There was times where, you know, you can't help but be like, okay, when is this going to be over? Like, when's, you know, sometimes you feel like enough's enough. But overall, man, at the end of the day, just when you lay everything out and realize what you have uh, and where you're at, you're like, oh, you know what? I don't like saying things could be worse. It's just like, you, you it's like, I'm good where I'm at. I'm very thankful. Yeah. Um, and well, that's, that's been the main th takeaway from the pandemic and lockdowns. I just appreciate things more. Yeah. And I think that that's, I mean, like for me, you know, first and foremost, it's like, so I've worked from home for the past like 12 years. So I've always kind of been in that environment. I'm an extrovert. So I've already kind of learned how to like manage my social needs in an environment where I work from home and I don't have people around me. And so it, for me, it hasn't been bad because, you know, I just, I have like my bubble of people that, you know, I don't have to wear masks around. And then I have my friends that I still see, we just meet up in open spaces. We, you know, meet at a park and have a coffee or whatever and uh, do our thing. And, but, you know, I'm safe. I have a job that's not putting me at risk. Um, I'm employed. I'm just grateful, you know, and I just try to, when I feel bummed or, you know, like, oh man, I'm bored. It's like Friday night. I want to do something that I just try to focus on. I'm safe. Just be grateful, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so it's just, you know, I mean, there's so many people that are struggling so hard right now. I have, I have a couple of friends that lost uh, parents in the past couple months. And like, you know, one of them, it was like a convalescent home type situation. So like in Florida, they live here in San, they live in San Francisco and uh, they couldn't go and see their parents and both of them got COVID and passed, you know, and it's just like uh, people that are dealing with that type of stuff. It's like, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm with you. I don't want to say it could be worse because, you know, I, I just try to be grateful and thankful for the moments that we have, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's just, just to quote an old Zen master, life's only available in the present moment, you know? So it's all about just being right here right now. I mean, you know, and like a big principle, I'm a, I'm a big, I love Zen Buddhism. So I'm like, and I'm just a big kind of, uh, you know, fan of it. You know, it's like 
those thoughts are going to come in the the worries about we project our worries in the past or like kind of traumas in the past into the present or we kind of you know get anxious because we don't know what's ahead of us but at the end of the day you got to you just realize that everything you're thinking from the past future it's about right here right now and the yeah. more you're here right here right now the better off you're going to be when that uncertain future comes and yeah. um and that's something i embrace a lot more during lockdown i had no choice but to really <laughs> just face things as they are i'm like well, let's look around me i'm got a roof over my head i got this you know ridiculously cute dog that keeps me really good company and um I, you know my finances are fine you know and i'm able to you know my biggest thing is like as i treat my dog like a kid so i'm like as long as my dog is okay she's got food water you know, enough money that I, if I've got for bed to take her to the vet, or if I need to do a vet checkup, I'm good. Yeah. That that's the, those are my priorities. You kind of, for me, I kind of realized, you know, I always felt that I was minimalist, but I feel like I'm even more so uh, after the fact, because you realize you don't need a whole lot. Uh, it's nice sometimes to have extra, but you don't really need it. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of, I'm, I think we align there. I'm very much a minimalist and like, I, I don't, I'm not like a things person. I mean, I have, a lot of kitchen stuff as a cook because <laughs> yes. I love to cook, but like I, I'm less is more for me. And, you know, and you know, I have a cat and I kind of feel the same way, but I'm like, she's good. We're good. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's just easier to be simple. You know, what are some of the things that I feel like also during this time too, like you, you kind of learn about yourself more too. Like it's sort of learn about those challenges and like, I'm, you know, I am an extrovert and I don't like get to like, down easily but the couple times that happened last year like the pits were like really low and i think it's just because you know we're kind of in this state where everyone's kind of bummed out bored you know like stressed that sort of thing and like the peaks and valleys can really hit low you know absolutely you strike me as someone because i i consider myself an empath and you strike me as someone who's quite an empath as well so i think when you feel that energy though because i noticed that when i started feeling down you know, you, it's, you can't help but think because you are like alone, I, I love, you know, yeah. when you live on your own. But when you start kind of seeing other people's social media posts, and this is when social media can be very useful. You're like, oh, it's I think just this mood's going around and like you're feeling that energy, you're feeling that dark cloud and circling back to what we were saying. It's like, just put it on perspective and know, like, are we good? Do I have a proof overhead? Do I have food? We're good, right. you know, and anything else outside of that? is just a really sweet bonus, you know? Right. Totally. Totally. I mean, um, yeah, it's, you know, and I, I can't help but think what if we had this going on, like during the nineties when we, the internet and streaming stuff was not as pervasive, you know, mm -hmm. and we didn't have Facebook or Twitter to really connect with people. You couldn't really text, you know I mean? Like just think like how difficult that challenge would have been. So I'm like, if I just have to sit there and watch Netflix to save the planet, Awesome. You know, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, <laughs> Jerry, in the 90s, we would have had uh, hope for our dial up modems would be quick enough to, <laughs> and like, we'd have to do so AOL and Instant Messenger if we tend right. to. Right. Exactly. Like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, I still, that sound still goes through my, just saying AOL Instant Messenger, I hear that dial up sound, you know? Um, yeah. It's, uh, so, you know, I mean, it, it could be worse. I'll just say it. I know we don't yeah. want to say it, but it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. So it's like, at the end of the day, always be thankful. You know, you just got to be, you know, I'm like my, my biggest thing is, you know, take the negative, turn it into a positive, you know, because you really can't take the good without the bad. You know, there's right. always, I've been on various podcasts in the past and, you know, we'll have these deep conversations and whenever the question comes up of, if you could go back and change one thing, what would it be? And I, it used to be, I'd be like, well, I would, you know, I would have, you know, I, I think about my college football career. I'm like, well, I would have stretched more and warmed up more or whatever. But, you know, you realize if I do that, then you're taking something else away. You know, everything yeah. you've done to get to this point, you know, the good and the bad are very integral to that journey. So yeah. whenever someone asks me that, I'm like, no, I wouldn't do anything because if you change one thing, another thing has to change. You can't get one without the other. Yeah. And no, it's totally true. Cause I, I mean, like I, I mean, I went to my degrees in computer engineering. So I was a software developer for 10 years for the Department of Defense. And then I took a U-turn and got into blogging and then got into food blogging and then got into YouTubing. And, you know, I mean, it, part of me goes back like, oh, I, we would have been great if I had started like the thing that I love to do, which is what I do now earlier. But, you know, who knows if I would have ended up here if I had taken the path I'd taken, you know? Yeah, and probably not. You know, I think <laughs> I think you got to view it that way. It's just every, you know, everything that, happen 
good, bad, ugly yeah. leads to where we are now. And uh, you yes. got to embrace it and accept it. And then, like I said, focus on the moment. You know, if you want to <laughs> carve out something better for you down the road, then focus on right now. So you did talk about, you know, like having, you know, roof over your head, having food, that sort of thing. Since I do food stuff, what kind of foods do you like? What are some of the things you like to eat or drink or, you know, cuisines that you like or particular flavor profiles that you're into? Oh, uh, you know, God, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so not picky when it comes to that. You know, I'm, like I said, I'm a very simple guy there too. If you give me deep fried Brussels sprouts with a little Parmesan cheese, I'm happy. You know, okay. I'll, I'll make do with that. You give me some peanut butter, a little bit of honey. You know, on, on like a toasted bagel, I'm also happy. But you know, I love a, you know, I love a good, I love a good taco. I love a good al pastor with a little bit of the fresh pineapple on top and everything. You know, there's this great taco truck in LA um, called Leo's Taco Truck, and they're only a dollar each. They have the best al pastor probably I've ever had. Okay. Uh, so just stuff like that. But I love seafood. I, I love everything. You know, I, I as far as um, you know, the only time I have. Freddie kind of ruined sushi for me because he took me to like, cause you know, he's Freddie's very well cultured. He downplays yeah. it a lot. He always plays the whole, he's very humble about, you know, the really big blessings he's had in his life. But, and I, cause I think he's very thankful about it, but you know, he'll take me to like Asanebo sushi, which has a five-star Zagat rating and a one word review that says perfection. And uh, I've gotten the omakase there and omakase with really good sushi. That's an experience just in and of itself. But that being said, you you need to be at a point where you can really appreciate it. Like, I think you got to have some of the not so good sushi before you can't start off with omakase because it's only downhill after that. And, okay. okay. So yeah, if I'm going to go all out, I do like that. I love a good Korean barbecue uh, nice. because, you know, I am Korean. So I think, I think, <laughs> I, I think I'd be disowned from Korea if, uh, if I didn't say that on, on your show. So I'm just going to make sure my bases are covered, but I don't want you to get disowned. No, 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 not at all. So yeah, I'm, I'm just, there's no easy answer to that. Cause I, I just, I like it all. Cause I'm, I, I think it just, that happened as I got older, obviously as a kid, all I wanted was pizza hut, you know, or like a, or an ecto cooler high C that's a deep hole from the eighties, nineties. You know, that was the, the special ghostbusters edition of high C you gave me that or Capri sun. If I could get the f-ing straw into the thing, which I, I really, with those straws, man, <laughs> you know what, I, but it came to the point. I just put it through the bottom of the pouch. Because yeah. I was like, I'm not doing it through here. And I, so that was my way. But, you know, as you get older, I guess you get a more open minded than least I did. And I, I'm nothing's off the table for me. If someone was going to say, try escargot, which I never have, I'll give it a shot. Okay. And if I don't like it, I don't like it. But I I feel like if enough people like it, <laughs> if it's prepared right, I think I'll be fine with it. So it's I'm an open book. Well, so I focus on vegetarian and vegan food, but I think like I should maybe do a recipe because I always do a recipe inspired by the interview. Um, maybe I should do something like a app of some sort that we can enjoy while we're playing Boulder Dash together. So I'm thinking I'll probably lean towards that. So any sort of favorite favorites? It sounds like you may you like Mexican food a lot, obviously. Um, any sort of like favorites as far as appetizers go? Uh, I mean, I don't even. No, man. <laughs> yeah, but I do. I do enjoy vegan cuisine a lot. Uh, you know, one of my really good friends is uh, the voice uh, name drop voice actress Tara Strong, who's the voice of like everything: Harley Quinn, Batgirl, uh, Bubbles on Powerpuff Girls. You know, if you look up Tara Strong, she's she literally is the voice of your childhood and your adulthood, and she's a vegan. And you, for a, about a year, I lived in her guest house, and be, from that, I was kind of being introduced to a lot of vegan cuisine yeah i think people have an idea like they're only thinking of boca burgers or whatever and boca burgers when they first came out were like yeah okay i mean it's a nice try but i don't i don't think this is going to last but it's come a long way and i think it's really cool the way you know how innovative it's gotten and it's also eye-opening you know if you had the right seasoning and the right preparation it's really close i mean the, the beef you can kind of tell but at the same time you know it's just I, I, food, good food's good food and, and i'm not i, I i'm a, I don't consider myself vegan, but there's times I'll just kind of, you know, live off of Gardein products. You know, instead of anything else. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll brainstorm some stuff and, you know. Maybe, maybe some vegan like buffalo wings or something like that. I think that's okay. always fun. If you do vegan okay. buffalo wings, I think that's fun. I haven't actually done, uh, I've been meaning to do this. So maybe that'll give me a good, because I know a lot of people have done like the cauliflower, like, you know, buffalo wing type things, whatever. But yeah, that'd actually be like a good thing to kind of explore. So. There we go. Now we have something. <laughs> Cauliflower pizza crusts are nice too. I, I do a sweet potato pizza crust when I when I oh. feel like doing that, and that's a lot of fun. 
Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I love how like experimental we've gotten with food as of the past, you know, handful of years. I think as plant-based options have sort of made their way into like mainstream and like as people are sort of struggling with dietary restrictions like gluten-free or whatever, you know, we've really started to explore these other options. And like even people who don't have those necessarily restrictions like yourself, you know, can partake in them because the cuisine is getting better, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what it's all about. It's all about innovation and progressing. You know, if you stay in one place too long, then the world's going to pass you by. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Um, so what, uh, what are some of your favorite restaurants in LA? Well, like I said, it's, uh, well, it's going back to Freddie Rooney sushi for me. Uh, well, that's shout out to Asanebo because they always, whenever I go there with Freddie, obviously we're very well taken care of because he has a, like a 20 year, I think relationship with them. Like he was going to oh, them right. like since he's before he made it. And then when he made it and continues to go there. So, and that, and that's the cool thing I love about restaurants is if I'm able to build a relationship with, with, uh, with the proprietor of that business, you know, then, then even better. So I'll take this moment. There's a place right next to us in Able called Hope, which is uh, stands for healthy, organic, positive eating. And it's all right. vegan Thai food. So if you're a fan of Thai food, it's all vegan options there. So, and it's right next to what else in Able. So if you don't want to spend the whatever hundreds of dollars on uh, Omakase, uh, go next door to Hope. Um, and uh, that's one of my favorites. There's a Thai restaurant that's not vegan called Barn Rao that we found by accident. It's just kind of, you know, those little, it should be on that show, Diners, Drivers and Dives, uh, hosted by Guy Fieri, because you would never think there's even a restaurant in this place. And it's the same guy cooking the food and it's unreal. Like it's the most authentic uh, wow. Thai food. I love probably get. I literally went to Thailand for a month just because I love Thai food. Like I was like, I don't know what the country's like. I'm just going to go. I love the food. <laughs> and it was amazing. It's actually one of the best places I've ever been to. Um, I would go back in a heartbeat. Um, but yeah, I love that cuisine. Maybe there's like a Thai spin on the buffalo wing thing. I think so. I, I think that's going to be all come down to uh, maybe it wouldn't be a buffalo wing. Maybe it's just maybe like a Thai wing and get some good like sesame seeds on there. It's like you know, yeah. the kind of cherry on the Sunday sort of thing. I think there could be, or maybe hemp seeds. There's hemp seeds now and that could add almost like a, cause hemp seeds almost have kind of like a nutty kind of flavor and it adds like a really fun layer to these savory dishes when you do that. So that, that could be something good there. Yeah. yeah I actually, okay. um, I blend in uh, hemp hearts into my smoothies. I like, I'm kind of like meal prep on the weekends and make my smoothies all ahead of time and freeze them. And I like always just dump in the hemp hearts. I like those a lot. They're tasty. And yeah, they're great. Yeah. Very healthy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's all the essential like omegas and everything you need. And, yeah. uh, and it's tasty too. It's not like you're putting like a weird seasoning on your food. It's it, right. it it. <laughs> so those are the two, you know, I, I don't go out to restaurants as much anymore. And, you know, and I like family owned places, you know, yeah. especially, you know, I love it even before the pandemic, but even more so now, uh, you know, because obviously if you're not a franchise, like a McDonald's, Wendy's, Taco Bell, like those are always going to exist. That's, that's the thing that I, that I tell people, I'm like, it's those mom and pop shops that, you could take for granted, but you've had, and you realize, and then once they're gone, you're like, Oh man, I really loved, you know, the vegan Mac and cheese at hope. I'm like, well, you, where were you three months ago, man? So, I know. Support them when you can. I know uh, last year I, I've been slowly trying to wean myself off of Amazon prime for that reason, like trying to buy more local, um, you know, and it's a challenge. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's hard because, you know, a lot of times, some of the places you go to that are small mom and pop things, not on the restaurant side, but like, you know, supply side of things, they don't always have it. You know, you're like, oh, I've driven to like four stores and like, yep. you know, <laughs> I'm like, it's so tempting just to pull out my phone and be like, order, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a good reminder. Cause I got, I got too used to that as well. So I'm trying to expand a little bit beyond that. And also, you know, it's uh kind of, kind of have to go old school a little bit because I got so used to Postmates, but I, then I realized that the restaurant doesn't really get that money, even though I want to support the independent contractors working for Postmates because they have every right to earn a living and income right. as well. But so I try to mix between the two because I do want to support those who are out there during a pandemic, driving right. around their cars, delivering these meals, but also the restaurants themselves. So it's to those out there, that's just, a, that's just an FYI. When you go to Grubhub, Postmates, DoorDash, a lot of that money doesn't go to the restaurant itself. If you want to support the restaurant itself, just call in and um, you can yeah. do the same curbside pickup or you can get delivery if they have delivery and it's, and it's worth it because you're keep helping keep their lights on and uh, keeping them open so that when the world opens up, 
they'll be there waiting for you. Yeah, I need to be better at that too. I definitely like um, am guilty of the ordering food thing probably more than I should. So um, it's so convenient, man. It's hard not to though. Cause like, it's an extra step. I got a call and then <laughs> well, I get to put on hold, which most of the time you are put on hold and you know, yeah. it's, it's you, well, we want everything right here, right now. So it's, yeah. it's a lot more tempting to go. The, well, a lot of times too, like when I order food, it's like, it's, it's kind of at the, like the most probably unexpected times that people would like would think, because it'll be like, I'll be recipe testing something the uh, the test, the heck out of it, you know, for a video. And it's, it's something like you wouldn't eat for dinner, right? Like you're not going to have like, you know, marshmallow stuffed brownies or whatever for dinner or something like that. Or so like I'll be recipe testing something like that and I'm kind of doing it over and over again. And so like the kitchen's sort of occupied, so I can't really make anything. So I'll order food, you know, it's like, yeah, I probably should just, you know, call them up and, you know, but I'm like, oh, I can just order it. It'll come while I'm still working, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah, man, that's uh, so, so anyone out there support local restaurants, support local businesses. And uh, after the pandemic too, because they're going to, yeah. you know, once the world's opened up, you know, that that's, I think a mistake a lot of people make in anything when you, when it seems like you're there, you reach kind of like a certain uh, pinnacle people tend to take their foot off the gas pedal, which maybe a little bit, but you know, don't lose sight. Like we still got, there's still work to do. And like, and nor yeah. for us to not go in cycles, we got to keep that momentum forward. And um, people keep cooking. I mean, people definitely yeah. are cooking more. And so I'm hoping that'll stick around a little bit, you know, I mean, just from a, you know, food security standpoint, I think it's, I'm hoping that sticks. <laughs> yeah. I hope so too. I hope so too. Do you have any fun projects coming up or that you're working on that you can talk about right now? Uh, do I? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I've been kind of on a hiatus from Gaghead because I've been here in Chicago, but I should be back in LA, I think sometime in March or, you know, late as okay. early April. And one of our flagship shows is the Settlers of Catan uh, virtual edition. Like I, we partnered up with the Catan creator. Oh, you do? Do you play? Yeah, I, I played a lot in like about five or six years ago and then kind of stopped. And I just recently started playing again. Well, brush up on your skills. And uh, when we're up and running again, uh, we'd love to have you on the show and come, oh, come play with us as a special guest, you know? And yeah, that would be awesome. I love that. It's a, uh, yeah. So, it's, so that was, that was that I'll slowly get back into the swing of things. There's a couple kind of irons in the fire, but until it's official, you know, it's not official. So right. you know, there's a lot of possibilities, which is good. That's again, be thankful. There's possibilities at all. There could yeah. very easily not be anything uh, on on the horizon at all and um so i always like i said being a quarantine it helps you gain perspective and be thankful for the little things you know and appreciate the journey yeah definitely i mean i, I it's for being more social but I, I do appreciate i mean i think one of the things that's I'm, that i'm also kind of helping sticks around is i really do appreciate that life's kind of slowed down a little bit you know i mean it's just slower you know and that's actually kind of nice <laughs> you know yeah i agree 100 percent. i think that's something i do want to carry over to when the world opens back up you know and it's you know it's it's obviously made me more transparent you know and like i have going back to what you were talking about in terms of kind of your bubble of people you can be around like freddie was in my bubble and, and his family and uh and you know because there are there are ways to be around people without masks on as long as everyone's transparent but you know a couple of people we wanted to meet up and I just straight up say like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not ready for that yet. But, you know, and I think, and I think certain qualities of the pandemic or what we did in quarantine will carry over. And I do hope that, you know, others follow suit and then that's going to, you know, hopefully, you know, lead to things just being better overall for everybody. Yeah. It's, I think the thing that's just going to really be fascinating, probably also a little sad, but just seeing how all this kind of shakes out over the next decade, because, you know, obviously there's this huge shift in the economy for people being able to work from home now, right? So that that's a big shift on, you know, commercial real estate because companies are now starting to see the benefit of home workers. They're like, oh, I don't have to pay for everything, you know? So that shifts. And then obviously we're seeing restaurants, a lot of restaurants close during this time and where those people are going to go and, you know, just all of those challenges. But like, on the other hand, they, that sort of stuff will lead to new innovation and probably people rethinking how we do business, how we live our lives and where that's all going to like kind of shake out too. So, you know, it's... Yeah. Good with the bad, like you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people, like I said, I've had many conversations, whether it's over Zoom or whatever. I just want to go back to the way it was. And I would tell them, like, I don't. And they look <laughs> at me like, what do you mean? Like, I was like, I don't mean I want to wear a mask forever, social distance forever. That's not what I mean. What I mean is 
I said, really honestly, look at kind of how you are going about your everyday life before COVID. And that was another honest thing I had to tell myself. I was kind of going through, mo- I was just going to the gym. I enjoy working out, but I was just going through this routine and not really putting purpose behind it, you yeah. know, not really appreciating it. You know, like the gym was more stressful than anything because I was spending half an hour looking for parking and then another half hour waiting for a machine to hopefully get on. And hopefully someone else is waiting for it too. And there's not that awkward moment of I get right. to the machine. They're like, Oh, were you waiting to, Oh, are we, oh but you can go. Are you sh- Oh, I can. Oh, are you sure? Are you sure? Like, <laughs> it happened like every time. So I think there's certain, and like, you know, like another thing about me is my sleep got a lot better during quarantine. I have this sleep app that I used and before the pandemic, According to my sleep app, I would fall asleep within one minute, which I thought I was just a very efficient sleeper. And then I talked to somebody, they said, you know, that means you're really, really sleep deprived. And I said, well, that's kind of messed up because that's how it's been. I've been using this app for a year and a half and that's the consistent fall asleep time. And, um, but during the quarantine, now it's at like, I fall asleep within 10 minutes, which they say Uh is very healthy. So it's little things like that. I suck at sleeping. So I'm (laughs) so jealous right now. I literally... I have to, I like, I round Robin on different drugs to like force myself to fall asleep. Cause I just, I'll get into this thing where like, it'll take me hours to fall asleep if I do fall asleep. And then like, if I wake up, I can't fall back asleep. And so I'll maybe sleep like two hours a night. And then I kind of cycle, I get sick from not being well rested. Mm-hmm. Then I sleep for like two days cause I catch up and then I, you know, kind of go back. And so like, I've been working on trying to fix my sleep for years. And so I kind of do like you know, like I'll do like CBD or sometimes edibles, or I have like some prescription stuff, but I really try not to take the prescription stuff as much as I can. Um, so, Hey, just be thankful that you can sleep. <laughs> oh, I am for sure. I'm, I'm, I mean, even when the time where I was sleep deprived and falling asleep as soon as I head at the pillow and now, you know, it's kind of nice, you know, cause I, I, I turn, I, there's no devices. I don't look at devices. Like before I go to sleep, it's like, I give myself a half hour of just kind of like, let's chill. And then I just kind of go through the process of going to sleep. And then, you know, that goes back to Zen and kind of meditation. If you just focus on your breathing, you know, that that's really going to what centers you and then allow your body to kind of relax. So that's, that's kind of my routine there, but it doesn't work for everybody. I mean, I take CBD as well and I'm, and I do edibles as well too. So I'm not afraid of that. And and those help also, those don't hurt. (laughs) Yeah. They, they, you know, sometimes you just need a little push and I hate like a lot of like the, prescribed sleep medication is something that you kind of have to take regularly. And so like, I'm not a big fan of that type of stuff. So I just try to avoid it, but, um, CBD helps a lot. So I like that a lot for it. Yeah. I I mean, I, I swear by CBD, I use the bombs and everything and I wish I had it when I was more active, like when I was a competitive athlete, you know, but, but back then we weren't thinking about recovery, you know, and like, you know, we weren't thinking about that stuff. I wish we were, but it was very, kind of cavalier just go out and play and if you're hurting then walk it off <laughs> that, that was it now it's uh there's a little more concern about it is it coddling maybe i mean that's that's open to interpretation but i i do i am glad there's more concern about concussion protocols i know we're getting a little off topic but it kind of led me to oh, you know, well, totally. i mean it's totally true i mean i think that you know i mean that's sort of I was reading this article the other day. It was kind of, it was about, um, I forget his name. Sorry. He's passed on at this point, but it's this guy that like, he does not, he helped remodel the Beverly Hills hotel. And so like, he was this really popular, like kind of, I guess, designer architect. Um, this, he did this in the forties, you know? So basically his career had like led him up to this point where he got to like remodel, like one of those iconic hotels in the country. Um, but because he was black, he actually couldn't go in it. So he like never got to appreciate yeah. the very thing that he like contributed to, you know? And it's just like, and I, I, you know, those types of things kind of coming out just makes my blood boil. And like, you know, kind of like the concussion thing, it's like, yeah, you have like this industry that thrives off all these people, but you know, they're not killing themselves, but they're pretty much, you know, ruining their lives. You know, it, it is important to be mindful of those things. And I'm glad that, you know, that's the coddling thing, right? Yeah, like there's the walk it off part, but it's good that we're starting to at least address those issues. I and mean, the pendulum will kind of, you know. <laughs> it's all balanced, my friend. It's all balanced yeah. at the end of the day. Exactly. I mean, it's just like in the Karate Kid when when uh, Mr. Miyagi's talking to Danielson about balance, you know, he's not just talking about, and he says it, he's like, I'm not just talking about karate. Your yeah. life needs balance, you know, and and uh, 
And that's a whole other comment. I love the Karate Kid. Like, I never get sick of that movie. And have you it's, watched Cobra Kai? I, I know. We're... Literally, we're just going to bring that up. So okay. I haven't yet. So because I want to go back and watch. I know you don't have to, but I want to go back and watch the Karate Kid movies and then watch it because I haven't watched them in quite a long time. Um, so that's sort of on my list of stuff to re-binge and then watch the Cobra Kai thing. But I'm super excited to because I used to. I used to actually. I, I've taken a lot of Taekwondo, like mostly when I was a kid. Oh, and really? I used to. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to compete and stuff and I got like trophies and stuff. And then now I have a really bad back injury. So I can't really, I have just kind of gotten to the point where I've thought like, maybe I can start doing Taekwondo again. If they don't, if I can like convince them to like, I just don't want to spar. Cause that's the main thing. Like with, I love the art form. I can do like, you know, I can probably mostly do most of the stuff still, but um, being kicked is the kind of thing that will like knock me out for like a week with my bad back. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so I can't like spar, but, um, but I love that type of stuff. Have you done martial arts? Yeah, I did Taekwondo as well growing up. Nice. And, um, and I got into traditional American boxing uh, as well when I got into my early teens. And that was a big humbling experience because for those who aren't familiar with either one, people know what boxing is, but in sparring, at least the way I was done with WTF Taekwondo, which is World Taekwondo Federation. There's also ATA, which is American Taekwondo Association. That's what I did, ATA. Uh, yeah, and there's also ITF. So there's three different federations of Taekwondo, and I did WTF, which is the more traditional from straight from Korea, Kukiwon, which is the Taekwondo headquarters in South Korea. You know, um, but point sparring is really you get hit, reset. It's like in the Karate Kid. You get hit, reset, and that's it. But in boxing, you get hit, you keep going until yeah. that three-minute bell rings. And and um, that was the biggest thing for me. And it, and it helped my helped my sports a lot and it helped my Taekwondo a lot because in boxing, footwork's everything. You're always moving, the constant movement. Yeah. And if you, you know, it's, it's a widely known thing that Bruce Lee would watch Muhammad Ali's footage and uh, flip it backwards because Muhammad Ali was orthodox and Bruce Lee was southpaw. He would yeah. watch the footage and flip it. And that if you watch Bruce Lee's movies, watch Big Boss, and then watch Return of the Dragon, where he fights uh, uh, Chuck Norris. In the Return of the Dragon, he starts kind of bouncing on his toes, kind of like Ali, kind of almost doing the Ali shuffle, and uh, just kind of moving, adapting. And that was a direct influence on Muhammad Ali. And um, and some, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm a big, like I said earlier, I'm a big student of everything. I love knowing more about it. And once I'm in, you know, it becomes a deep dive. You know, and yeah. you know, I'm, I'm asking questions. Probably it's probably a, a big aggravation to whoever's teaching me because like, I'm literally asking, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Like, you just gotta go with it. And then at some point, I do have to let it go. But I'm very, I very much want to know this everything there is to know about it. So I just know it cold. Yeah, it's. I mean, I feel like well, and the thing with sparring too, and like, so I took I took it taekwondo a little bit as an adult and what would happen and this kind of I think just gets into like sort of like the Magal ego realm or whatever is I would you know every now and then you just kind of get that guy that you know he's he's there to prove something you know he's not there necessarily to embrace the martial art or grow with it he's just you know he has something that he's trying to work out you know and I'm like six one and a big dude and so like when they spar with me they just like they're just trying to clobber me versus just trying to make contact for a point, you know, and I would get kicked and it would just like debilitate me because of my, you know, back injury. And so, um, but I love the art form of it. I love like, you know, where they're getting into the details. I'm like, okay, you have to like point your foot this way or have your mm -hmm. pelvis that way. And like your toes, are, you know, I love like all those little minute details, almost like in dance, it's sort of that aspect of it where you're really focusing on the physicality. So I've been kind of thinking like, well, my back, so six years ago, literally I had like doctor's orders. I couldn't walk more than a quarter mile a day. Wow. Like I was debilitated. And um, like, if I was in a passenger in someone's car and they just like accelerate from the, uh, from like a stop sign or whatever, like it almost like just that motion would almost bring me to tears. It was that bad. And so, but now I can actually function and move and stuff. And so I'm like, oh, I kind of want to go back into Taekwondo, but I don't want to spar. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> you, uh, you know, another thing I got into, which was more in the recent years, is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I, I loved it so much. And it's it's probably the most misunderstood martial art from a broad spectrum. Because with, with Taekwondo, Muay Thai, Kung Fu, boxing, if an outsider watches it, they can understand it. It's a little more linear. It's like you get hit, yeah. this person gets hit, don't get hit. But with to the outsider, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it looks like just a couple dudes or a couple girls or whoever in pajamas <laughs> rolling around on the mat, which... Um, you know, it is that, but it's not that. And it opened my mind up because in order to really spar in jujitsu, you have to let your mind go and just see what's in front of you and free flow where 
in martial arts, as you know, it's a lot of fixed positions. So there's a lot of steps. And this is the thing that Bruce Lee had a big problem with, with a lot of uh, martial arts is they say, if somebody grabs your collar, they say, first do this, first grab the wrist like this, and then turn it like this, and then do this, where it's like on the street, just step on his instep and he'll let go. You know, yeah. He's like, <laughs> make it a more clear path, which is a lot of what jujitsu is. You really had to be present and focus on what's going on, because if you're not, and you're too focused on trying to get the, the arm bar, try to get the triangle choke, you're going to be caught in your own head. And if that person's uh, more advanced, then they're just going to be able to submit you. And right. it actually helped my, funny enough, my Xbox gaming, because I was, it's funny, I'm, I'm a creative and I'm very right brain, but at the same time, I, I like to find that left brain kind of path. So when I played video games, I was playing, you know, Madden, NBA 2K, because there's just it's straightforward. I know what I got to do. You know, if I play Mortal Kombat, I just got to beat the dude up and not before he kills me, you know, but there's open world games like Sea of Thieves, which, you know, that was a little tough for me. It's like, what am I trying to do here? And then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu kind of opened up that part of my brain that allowed me to just kind of free flow. Let's, let's see what's here and uh, see what happens. You know, it doesn't always have to be a clear linear path. So uh, that could be something interesting. Obviously, you would have to wait till we're all vaccinated, and right. you, know, <laughs> you, you can't really roll with somebody unless you both know you don't know COVID and everything. But something to think about. And I think with the right instructor, you know, you would be able to maybe even strengthen your back and you know yeah. add more flexibility you may not have had before. Yeah, I mean, I'm open to other. I've, I did try to like kind of figure out if there was another martial art form I wanted to try because I love like you know um I love those I love those movies um in fact I told Freddie this when we when I interviewed him um so my literally my favorite tv show all time is Buffy and um I had put like a post-it note on my monitor to like not ask him anything about related to that because I didn't want I wanted to be about his cookbook and I wanted to remind myself you know um and I just I love like you know martial art type fighting uh things or whatever like you know and so I would love to explore some other art forms. I just don't really know much about other ones other than Taekwondo. Yeah, 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 totally. Well, have you seen, do you have an HBO Max subscription by chance? I, yeah. Have you watched Warrior? I haven't. Warrior is a lot of fun. And Warrior, a little um, little backstory on that. Uh, so as you know, there was a show called Kung Fu starring David Carradine. Um, I don't know if you know the story before that. Tech, like Bruce Lee, he pitched a show called Warrior, which was supposed to be Kung Fu, but then they rubbed him out of it because he was quote too Chinese looking. They didn't want to put him on mainstream television. So they gave it to David Carradine. They pretty much stole his story and said David Carradine was quote half Chinese and Kung Fu went on to be a big hit with a broad audience, but warrior is really taking it back to the roots of what Bruce was trying to create. Okay. And um, with like today's technology, it's, it's, it's cool, man. It's, it's really slick how they do things because it starts out with them speaking Chinese, but the way they are able to show like you're in their world and like allow these Asian actors to speak without accents. It's, it's, it's slick, man. And the fighting is a lot of fun. The fighting is okay. a lot of fun too. So yeah, be patient with it. It's, it's a little, for me personally, my only critique, and this isn't a knock on the show, like, you know, sometimes there's a little more air in it that I, that I care for a little more exposition, like expositions are important, but I do think like you told me, one of the advices you gave me in terms of our YouTube videos is give people a little, little of their dessert first and then right. feed them everything else. Show them how you got there. And, yeah. um, you know, they sometimes don't give enough dessert up front, but the payoff is always great. But sometimes like you may have to be a little patient with it. But I highly so, recommend it. <laughs> OK, well, I will definitely check that out because um, it's not like I don't. I have anything else to do but watch TVs. <laughs> but you mentioned two things I want to talk about. One, um, I mean, that kind of brings you back to like the changes I even made with my video. So I, I gave you that info. And like now what I the, uh, kind of coming back to the changes I made on my YouTube channel, I cut out my intro. Like now it's just like, it's just straight into the action. And that's the thing that's sort of seeing the spike is, you know, I used to kind of wax on a little bit about what I was going to make before I started making it. And it wasn't very long. It was only about like maybe 30 seconds, but um, you know, I had this dip on my YouTube videos and I, I was like, how can I get rid of that dip, you know? And so now I just moved everything forward. It's just straight into the dessert and like, you know, it totally helped. But, uh, you mentioned the thing about, um, you know, with Bruce Lee and being too Chinese and it's just like, I think, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on just like all the, you know, increased crap that's happening like to the, you know, Asian communities right now, just like all the hate that's kind of going on you know, how you're 
looking at that, have experienced anything, anything like that, as far as, you know, I know that stuff is hate crimes in general have gone up, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, there seems to be just, you know, because of <laughs> how the uh, pandemic was sort of aimed at, you know, uh, China virus, I hate even saying that thing, but, yeah. um, you know, like, have you had to deal with any of that at all? Me personally, no, uh, luckily no, because like I'm a, people weren't going to really mess with me. I'm a six foot, I'm six foot two and kind of broad shoulder for the most part. Look, when you look at these attacks and this is what's really infuriating is they're going after elderly Asian Americans, wow. you know, so they're purposely going after people who they think like can't defend themselves. They're not going to go after me because yeah. like, I'm just going to say they're a little bit <laughs> because they're, they're not going to go after someone who can actually fight back. They're, they're doing it to kind of satisfy whatever insecurities they have with their own ego. That That's really what it is. And it's like, it's unfortunate because there's people that exist in this world who, you know, validate their own self-worth by putting others down. It's the whole, I don't know if it's crab in a barrel. Crab in a barrel is more like you're trying to pull someone down, but someone who's at the king of the hill and doesn't yeah. want to share that space up here. Like, hey, I'm looking at this view, but you guys can't see. You guys right. stay down there and know your place. And and um, yeah, you know, the, the biggest, to me, the biggest, um, you know, the, the, the really unfortunate thing about it rather is, not all of it is really being reported by, by news outlets, you know, yeah. and, you know, that then there's been a big kind of um, increase in people being vocal about Daniel Day Kim and Daniel Wu, who are two kind of, I consider them the trailblazers. They, they kind of set the example for guys like me to really, you know, speak out on certain things. And yeah. Daniel Day Kim is always on it. He's talking about what's going on in New York. And now he's teamed up with Andrew Yang and Andrew Yang's being vocal because he's got a huge platform. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's so, unfortunate it's like it makes me really happy it makes me really sad. not happy i've got that no 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 not that it makes me really angry it makes me really sad all at the same time because my mom's an elderly asian woman you know luckily yeah. we live in a very safe suburb so i don't you know i don't think anything's gonna happen to her here but if if we were in downtown chicago and she was walking here er to do errands the scary thing is it could happen to her and that's the first thing that i think of you know and like when you look at interviews of lebron james and they're talking about Ahmad Arbery. They're talking about George Floyd. They're talking about Jacob Blake. You know, he's like, I think of my boys. And I think about what if they're walking home and this happens to them. So yeah. for me, it's like, if this happened to my mom, you know, that that thought alone just sends me down a pretty dark path. But, yeah. you know, like I said, but going back to turning negative into a positive, unfortunately, these things happen. But the thing we can do is be vocal about it. And, you know, it starts with the Asian community. Like we're all kind of letting our voices be heard, but it's, you know, like it needs to happen with all of us, you know, and there's this old quote, I think, God, I, I forget who said it. It's a brilliant quote that she said, but she said, if my brothers draw a circle to exclude me, I'm going to draw a bigger circle that includes me and them, you know, and I think that's what inclusion is, you know, so yeah. for me, it's like, I, I can't force people to post things. I can't force people to care, but I'm going to make some noise. And, you know, at some point, some of you are going to listen and hopefully you, you join the cause with us. Yeah. Just like with the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, yeah. that was just the most, some of the most tragic stuff that I've ever, we've ever had to witness in real time. But to see so many people coming together from different backgrounds and blacking out their Instagrams and blacking out their social media and using the hashtags, you yeah. know, that's, that's, you know, that's the good that can come out of it. So I think I'm hoping that this, you know, stop Asian hate hashtag keeps on catching on and people realize you know, this isn't the way to go. And, you know, the, the other sad thing about it is I, th I think the people who are bigots and the people who are trying to keep us down, the thing that pisses them off the most and scares them the most is that we're human beings just like them. You know, yeah. the people who are, you know, racist or transphobic, the thing that pisses them off the most is that we're also human beings. It's like, at the end of the day, man, you could be a Caucasian male, age 40, whatever. So obviously everyone's going to listen to you no matter what, even if what you say is full of right. But you are human just like us. And I think that's what really gets to them, which is unfortunate, but we'll keep reminding them. Well, it, and I agree with you. I think that, you know, it's, um, I think also too, when you come from this point of privilege, like equality for others starts to feel like oppression, right? Because you've, you've been treated better and now you're seeing that equality spread. And, you know, it's like, it, it, I, I understand why they feel threatened the thing that like, I just don't understand is like, at some point you don't, you check yourself and just kind of be like, okay, <laughs> you know, how far down this path are you going to go to like protect what you think is rightfully yours? It's just so, 
you know, um, I, I've told this story many times and usually in these interview things, but like my mom, she's 80, you know, and, you know, when I grew up, she was Republican. My, her and my dad were both Republicans. Um, he's since passed and she's now also pretty on the liberal side. But when the Black Lives Matter stuff was going on, she was like, I don't understand why all lives matter is offensive. Like she like came, you know, called me up. It's like, I'm just trying to figure it out. You know, it's like, it doesn't, you know, and so, it, you know, and here she is like 80 year old trying to like, you know, do that work. And I think that's the thing. It's like a lot of people have to do that work and it's not um, always easy. And, you know, and it's humbling. And sometimes, you know, you kind of, you know, maybe might be a little embarrassed to ask the questions that you want to ask, but, you know, it's just, it's sad to see that these things are happening. And I don't want to say like, you know, um, I think people think that these are new things that we're just encountering. Like they're, you know, that's the other sort of fallacy to all this. Like it hasn't been going on all this time. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, especially with the Black Lives Matter thing, because people are like, oh, this is like, to anyone out there, Black Lives Matter started in 2013. So this has been going quite a long time in terms of when that movement started. Um, yeah, man, it's, uh, you know, going back to the All Lives Matter thing, the, the way I explained it to somebody, because uh, they they were asking me, and I said, okay, think of it this way. If you break your arm, what happens? You got to get the bone set, put an arm in a cast, and then you got to let it heal. So it needs more. It's like, they're like, right. I said, does that mean your right arm doesn't matter? Does that mean your your leg doesn't matter? Does that mean the rest of your bones in your body don't matter. They say, no, I'm like, exactly. But this left arm that got broken is broken. It needs help. So it needs more attention. And I said, that's what's going on. Like, and they're, <laughs> and this person didn't, it's like, well, that's a totally different thing. I'm like, no, it's actually not. The reason why black lives matter right now is a movement. And you know, is because black people are getting killed. <laughs> like, right. There's no other way to say it. So we need to make sure that this doesn't keep happening. This yeah. doesn't mean that the lives of Caucasians, Asians, Hispanics, you know, whoever don't matter. It just means that this particular group needs that extra, you know, love and attention. And yeah. Uh, you said it in a nice, much nicer way than I have. I would like, <laughs> I've been like, just cause you say like save the whales doesn't mean like fuck off and die turtles. It's just means like you're <laughs> trying to like address something, you know, but the thing that got my mom around was cause my mom's first generation, her dad escaped uh, the Armenian genocide. And so like, you know, he immigrated over here because he was, you know, a uh, refugee. And, you know, I was trying to explain to her, like the thing that finally sank in with her, I was like, you know, what if he came over here and was like, people were like, eh, all genocides matter or whatever, you know, just kind of denouncing and sort of dismissing the thing that, you know, his family has been killed, his friends have been killed, you know, and, you know, and so it's just, you know, it took her kind of having a personal understanding of it, you know, and I, and I think that's part of it, you know, I think it's just, you know, people being, empathetic or not, you know? Yeah. You know, and it, and it's upbringing because, you know, I grew up in a very, you know, white middle upper class suburb, you know? So it's just, to me, I, you don't, when you're young, you don't realize that there's a world out. You don't realize how big the world really is. You know, you yeah. kind of have an idea. You're not naive to the fact because it's talked about, but all you know is what's in front of you. It's only until you get older and kind of start exploring. And it's really, when I look in retrospect, I'm like, oh, wow. Like there were a lot, like, especially when I, I'm, not, I'm pretty outspoken when it comes to social justice, especially on my, my Facebook page, which uh, is a little more personal because there's people that I grew up with. Yeah. The amount of people from my hometown, man, that were trying to denounce what I was saying about, you know, the January 6th, you know, capital attack. And, you know, and I, I, I won't, I don't have to, I basically said, look, if, if this was a group of minorities, then this is a totally different story. And this person's oh. like, Oh no, it's not like there were people from my high school. And I was like, wow. Like, I went to school with you guys and I considered you friends, but, but I guess my point is when that's all, you know, like you accept that as quote normal. And yeah. it's only after the fact you realize, I mean, whether that's being, you know, being woke or whatever the term you want to use at some point you realize, Oh, that's kind of, up. <laughs> you know, that's uh, what can I do to be better though? There's nothing I can do to change it, but what can I do from here on out? Yeah. And I, I totally agree. I mean, I have some of that stuff too. I'm also very vocal about those things online and, like some of my high school friends, well, most of my high school friends that didn't agree with me have like just unfriended me at this point because they couldn't handle me like just speaking out. But um, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's um, and it's been happening for a long time, and it needs to stop. And you know, I, it, to me, like people, the people that are like that have issues with that stuff, I just I don't get how. I just don't understand that bubble at all. You know, it just yeah. really confuses me. It's like how how do you walk around with those blinders? You know, like I mean, I learned 
that black people and Mexican people were treated differently growing up. Like I would, you know, we moved out to California. I grew up in, I was born in Ohio. We moved out here when I was like three, you know, I learned that pretty quickly, just observing, you know, how things go, you know, it's not, it doesn't take a genius, you know? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if, you know, uh, in order to really just see, you just got to look and like the people cut the quote, the end of the movie, uh, you remember the movie Gremlins? And I swear I have a point to this. <laughs> uh, at the end, when the old man comes back to grab Gizmo and, you know, Giz- you hear Gizmo kind of talking in his own like thing. And then he's like, huh? And then Billy's like, you understand him? And the old man says, in order to understand, one only needs to listen. And, you know, I think I know that's oversimplifying. But at the same time, is it really? It's like if you listen to what someone has to say, you know, and, I, and I'll listen to the other side. I'll, I'll I'll hear out somebody else who's on because I want to know, like I said, I want to know like what is driving you to think this, and and it's exactly what you're saying. They're they're refusing to take the blinders off. They're refusing to go outside their bubble, uh, yeah. which is unfortunate because you know I'm a very optimistic person, but at the same time, you know I don't know if I would hope we get to a point where the blinders come off. But I, yeah. I think you know I think that's just a part of our own kind of growth we're going to encounter that and it's how we react to it. We, you know, we don't have any say in, you know, who we are, what ethnicity we're going to be, what our sexual orientation, what if we right. are going to consider ourselves non-binary, you know, the, whatever gender pronoun we have really no say, like that's just who you are and then yeah. you got to go with it. But, you know, we definitely have a say in how we treat people. And um, when people are choosing hate, then that's a conscious choice. Right. And, uh, <laughs> that's the thing that they need to realize. It's like, you're choosing to, to be this way. You know, we didn't do this to you. Well, and I think and it's just so fear-based, you know, I mean, I, I just don't understand being like, if someone wants, if someone's transgender and you, whatever, whatever you think about it, like why if you feel threatened by it, you know, that's the part I don't understand. It's like, okay, so maybe you disagree. Maybe you're not quite there yet, but like, why is it so threatening? You know, like that's the part that just blows my mind. So yeah, it's, it's their own internal insecurities that they're projecting outwards you know yeah. and, and hopefully they get it someday but at the end of the day it's out of our hands you know we can do so much we can only do so much but then we gotta we gotta take care of ourselves at the end of the day you know well on to happier things when this is all over we're gonna play boulder dash play some settlers of Catan, <laughs> make some buffalo tie something i don't know what that's gonna be yet and you know um we can just talk Taekwondo and maybe bad uh, 90s movies or something. <laughs> yeah, no, man. I lo- 90s was a great era for that. You know, I, I've been revisiting a couple. There's that, you know, I grew up in Chicago during the 90s. So everything was Michael Jordan and Chicago Bulls. And it's it's kind of crazy. Like everyone on those teams, especially the 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 second 3P, 96 through 98, like everybody was getting a movie deal or something. And there's this god awful movie called Double Team. Uh, with Dennis Rodman and Jean Claude Van Damme, and it's, and I it's I, you don't even have to like explain it any. Oh, further. dude, it, it is hilariously bad, but it is it is a joy to. Watch. It's like watching Schumacher's Batman and Robin. It's like you know what you're gonna get. Just enjoy it. It's not like you're watching a, you know, the a, a, a brilliant reinterpretation of Macbeth. It's nothing like that. It's not gonna win an Oscar, but sometimes you just need to like not have to watch something really deep. You just want to unwind. Yeah. I recommend <laughs> watching. Um, Double team. It, what is, it's funny because I was directed by this really famous uh, Chinese director, Sui Hawk, uh, who was, did a Chinese ghost story, like these really great Chinese films. And then you look at double team and obviously there is probably miscommunication or just like a communication barrier. But but I do recommend I think it's on Netflix uh, unless they pulled it. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> So yeah, bad '90s movies and everything. Uh, I, I'm all for that, and I, you know, talk about old '90s sitcoms and everything. Yeah, so I'm into it. We can. You, me, and Freddie can mystery science theater it and make fun of stuff and live stream it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Freddie, you know, Freddie did Tang Sudo, which is very similar to Taekwondo, but yeah. Uh, so I mean, he's he's very much. We're very much cut from the same cloth that way. When we first got to know each other, I, you know, I kind of learned about who he learned from, what martial arts styles he did, and you know. Um, you know, it's, it's cool, you know, and, and I like learning other people's kind of journeys through that. So I look forward to that conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, t- I appreciate you taking time to chat with me today. Um, where can people, you know, check out what you're doing, stay on top of, you know, the projects that you have going on uh, when gay heads back up and running? Yeah, I, I prefer they don't check out when I go. go no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's just at John Lee Brody, uh, John with no H, uh, all across the board, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube channel, www.youtube.com forward slash Gaghead. That's Egghead with a G in front of it. And uh, check us out there. I believe Freddie's going to start. Uh, he was doing a Sea of Thieves RPG campaign okay. and we did two episodes so far. And I believe he's going to start doing more. So I'd be on the lookout for those. And, you know, as the year progresses and as we hopefully find our way, you know, putting the pandemic behind us, we'll have some more content. Hopefully, you know, Mr. Jerry's going to join us too for a couple things. And, you know, and maybe we can have some of these uh, channel crossovers and uh, yes. make something cool happen. Yes. Um, and when you have YouTube questions, feel free to hit me up. I'm happy to, we can jump on a Zoom call. I can show you all the back end stuff. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I'll bet. I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. If you're going to offer that, then I'm, then I'm in. You're, you're going to regret offering that to me, but. <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. I am happy to help. Like I said, I, I've, I've benefited from people lending me a hand um, who, you know, got nothing out of it. And I know exactly how, um, that can change everything for someone. So I'm totally down to help out. So, um, well, I would, so man, if I, if we can ever help out or if I can ever help out, uh, you know, open to you as well. Balderdash, so we'll play some board games. We're good. <laughs> maybe we can juxtapose Balderdash and Settlers of Catan, you know, maybe uh, when someone rolls a seven, if you like do like a better Balderdash than whoever rolled a seven, then you don't get robbed. Maybe we can do a crossover there too. You know, I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do too. I kind of just made that shit up as I went. And I was like, I don't know how this is going to sound, but I'm going to go for it. I was like, I actually, that could you know, work. I, I think we'll grab a bottle of tequila and figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> make it a double. Well, well yeah. you know, after this, shit, like, we'll make it a triple actually. So yeah. well, I'm down. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Thank you so much. Well, I really do appreciate this. This is great. I really love having people on my channel just to kind of show how food kind of brings everything together and, this is a great example of that. So I look forward to, uh, I'll let you know, like um, when I get that recipe finalized and uh, when the video is going to come out and I really do appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. Hey, hey, thanks for, thanks for asking me, man. I'd love to come back anytime. If you run out of guests, you know, just, just hit me up. <laughs> I think that we can make that happen. <laughs> all right. All right. It right, sounds awesome. like a plan. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. There was my interview with Johnny Brody. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So just so you know, I also did a recipe. So look on my channel for these baked Thai cauliflower wings. Super tasty. John, I think you're going to like them. I hope we get to make them together sometime, play some tabletop games and just chill out. I'll see you guys next time.